Hello, today Nana Girl. Today we're going to be solving May June 2020 Paper 1 Variant 3. But we're not going to be solving all the questions, we are only going to be solving the harder questions or the common misconceptions of the paper. If you need the full paper, there are many brilliant YouTubers which are also solving past paper questions. You can go and check their videos out. Before we start, we are currently offering free topic 1 notes. All you have to do is fill in the form in the description box down below. We are also selling topic 2 notes which include all the tips, tricks of paper 1, and common misconceptions with worked examples too. Upon purchase, you can ask us a limited number of questions about the topic or past paper questions for free and you are able to exclusively contact us at any time, which is a new and unique service. We also have another monthly service which you can ask us unlimited number of questions and past paper questions for the full AS biology syllabus only for $15 per month and you can contact us at any time for unlimited number of questions. Question number two. The electron micrograph shows parts of a eukaryotic cell. Which cell structure is the site of protein synthesis? So as we all know, the site of protein synthesis are ribosomes on rough endoplasmic reticulum or ribosomes free in the cytoplasm. So that's what we're going to be looking for. Now for A, this looks like a lysosome. Therefore, it's incorrect. For B, here you could see dark black granules. And this is what ribosomes look like under an electron microscope. So B is going to be the correct answer. For C, you could see a cylindrical structure. Therefore, this is going to be the centrioles. And for D, because we can see vesicles, then most likely this is going to be the Golgi body. Or the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, but it's not really visible here. But it cannot be the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it does not have a granular appearance. Therefore, B is the correct answer. Number 4. A molecule of carbon dioxide is in the center of a mitochondrion. Assuming there are no other cell structures in its path, how many phospholipid layers will the carbon dioxide molecules have to pass through in order to leave the cell? So, let's draw here a microtubule. And let's draw the cristae. And let's assume that this is going to be the cell surface membrane. Now, as we all know, mitochondria is a double membrane structure. Therefore, in the cristae, this is two layers of phospholipid. Therefore, there is a phospholipid bilayer in the inner layer or the cristae, and there is another phospholipid bilayer on the outer mitochondrial membrane. Therefore, it has to pass through the first two layers into the intermembrane space, then outside the mitochondria through the outer membrane. Therefore, that counts as a total of four phospholipid layers while leaving the mitochondria. Now, as we all know, the cell surface membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. Therefore, it would have two phospholipid layers. Therefore, 4 and 2 gives us a total of 6 layers of carbon dioxide leaving outside the cell. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Question number 6. The color of a positive Benedict's test is due to the formation of copper oxide. The mass of copper oxide is proportional to the mass of reducing sugar present. Samples of fruit juice were tested for the presence of reducing sugars and non-reducing sugars using Benedict's test. The table shows the mass of copper oxide after boiling with Benedict's solution and after acid hydrolysis and boiling with Benedict's solution. Which sample contained the most non-reducing sugar? Now let's break down the question. First of all, as we all know, Benedict's test tests for reducing sugars. And hydrolyzing the solution after adding acid is the test for non-reducing sugars. The reason of that is to break the glycosidic bond to form a reducing sugar. Now, here it says which sample contained the most non-reducing sugar. So the sample containing the most non-reducing sugar is going to have the greatest difference in the mass of copper oxide. Now here, there's almost no difference. It's 20 and 20. 
Therefore, it means that there is no reducing sugar present in that sample after hydrolysis. For B, the difference is 15 milligrams. For C, the difference is 5 milligrams. And for D, the difference is 10 milligrams. Therefore, because B has the greatest difference in mass after acid hydrolysis, this means that B has the most reducing sugar. Therefore, B is the correct answer. And please don't be tricked of the mass at the start. We're here looking at the differences in mass, not at the initial masses. Question number eight. The diagram shows a small part of a polypeptide. What would be the products if the part shown was completely hydrolyzed? Now, don't be tricked by the question. Let's just break it down. What we must do first is to look for the peptide bonds. Now, as we can see here, a carboxyl group and an amine group. Therefore, a peptide bond is between them. And also here. Now we found the positions of peptide bonds. Now let's draw them out. Therefore, as we see here, C and D. So these are going to be correct. And B is incorrect because here it only has a hydrogen. It doesn't actually have a hydroxyl group. Same with here. It has only one hydrogen attached to the nitrogen. It must be two hydrogens attached. Therefore, these are totally incorrect. Now, let's look at the rest. C must be totally incorrect because here a hydrogen atom must be visible and we cannot see. Therefore, D is going to be the correct answer. Number nine, the enzyme trypsin hydrolyzes proteins to amino acids. Trypsin does not function when the pH is very low as its 3D shape would be changed. What explains this change in 3D shape? Now let's also break down the question and the bonds that's going to be visible in the tertiary structure because here it says it's an enzyme or hydrogen bonds. Hydrophobic, hydrophilic, and disulfide bonds. Now, as we all know, a decrease in pH means that the concentration of hydrogen ions increases. When this happens, hydrogen ions alter the hydrogen bonding and the hydrophilic bonds holding the tertiary structure of the enzyme. Therefore, what ends up happening is that the active site actually ends up changing shape, where it's no longer complementary to its substrate. Therefore, the enzyme trypsin does not function well in low pH because it does not hydrolyze proteins. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. It says, what explains this change in 3D shape? A. Hydrogen ions attach themselves to negatively charged R groups. This is correct and because we said it alters the ionization of the bonds. Therefore, A is going to be the correct answer. For B. Hydrogen ions disrupt disulfide bonds. This is incorrect because disulfide bonds are actually covalent bonds. And they are the most stable and withstands the most change in temperature or increase in temperature. Therefore, it breaks really hard. It does not break easily at all. Therefore, hydrogen ions are not strong enough to disrupt the very strong covalent bonds. Therefore, this is incorrect. The hydrogen ions increase hydrogen bonding between amino acids. This statement is totally incorrect. The reason for this is that hydrogen bonding occurs between the partially positive hydrogen atom and a partially negative oxygen atom. Therefore, hydrogen ions do not have an effect on the hydrogen bonding or increase the hydrogen bonding, so this is incorrect. D. Hydrogen ions reduce the affinity of hydrophilic R groups for water. Even if this statement was actually correct, even though it's incorrect, it does not explain the change in the 3D shape. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 10. The flowchart shows some of the steps in the formation of collagen, which row correctly identifies X, Y, and Z. Now, let's first break down the structure of collagen. As we all know, collagen is made up of three polypeptide 
chains held together by hydrogen bonds and some only some covalent this forms a collagen molecule consisting of three polypeptide chains. Now, many of these collagen molecules, so many collagen molecules, forms collagen fibrils. And many collagen fibrils form co a collagen fiber, so a massive collagen fiber so this is the order of its structure now let's see the suggestions that we have here now for x three polypeptide chains held together by x bonds as we just said is going to be hydrogen bonding and some covalent bonds now the reason why peptide is incorrect as we said holding the three polypeptide chains together is quaternary structure And as we all know that peptide bonding only occurs in the primary. Therefore, D is incorrect. Now let's look at the rest. Forms a triple helix, which is a collagen molecule held together by intermolecular bonds. Now for Y, as we said, it's going to be fibrils, then Z is going to be fibers. Be careful, this is a common misconception. Microfibrils are not visible in collagen. They are not found in collagen. It's only fibrils, then fibers. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be B. Number 11, which molecules contain at least two double bonds? Now, here we have saturated fatty acid, collagen, and hemoglobin. As we all know that saturated fatty acids only has one carboxyl group at the end of the carbon chain. So let's assume that this is a carbon chain. Therefore, it does not have at least two double bonds or we cannot guarantee that. So one is going to be incorrect because the double bonds occur in the carboxyl group, as you can see here. For two, collagen and here we have hemoglobin. As we all know, collagen and hemoglobin are proteins. And as we all know that proteins are made of amino acids of many thousands of amino acids and if we draw down the structure of amino acids it would look something like this the R group is the side chain by the way so as you can see here an amino acid has a carboxyl group and because collagen has thousands and same with hemoglobin has thousands of amino acids therefore we can guarantee that both a collagen and hemoglobin molecules are going to have at least two double bonds therefore only two and three is correct and the answer is going to be d number 12 two experiments x and y were carried out using an enzyme from humans Experiment X was carried out at a constant temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. During experiment Y, the temperature was increased from 37 degrees Celsius to 80. All other factors were kept the same, which graph shows the results. Now, let's also break down the question. Here it says using an enzyme from humans. Therefore, this means that the optimum temperature must be 37 degrees as shown here. So, X was carried out at a constant temperature of 37 degrees, therefore, X is going to have the highest rate of reaction or the greatest product. And for experiment Y, as we all know that the temperature was increased, then most likely the enzyme was denatured halfway through the reaction so not denatured right away but denatured halfway through the reaction now let's see the suggestions that we have here let's look at a in a here we can see that the product concentration keeps increasing then lies constant earlier at y and also lies constant at x this is actually correct the reason for this is that product concentration increases up to a certain point when the temperature 
for Y starts increasing from 37 to 80 degrees, this means that the enzyme has been denatured halfway and only some substrate have been converted into products. However, in X, because it's operating at the optimum temperature of the enzyme, this means that the rate of the reaction keeps increasing and the product concentration keeps increasing until there is no more substrate until all the substrate molecules has been formed into products and this is the maximum product concentration therefore it lies plot you therefore a is the correct answer now let's look at b and the rest and i'll tell you why they are incorrect here for why we could see that somehow the product concentration increased then decreased again in this question it's incredibly vital to look at the x-axis and the y-axis so look here at the x-axis and the y-axis the y-axis says product concentration it doesn't say the rate of the reaction beware therefore it's completely impossible for product concentration to suddenly increase up to a certain point then decrease again as the reaction proceeds it doesn't occur like that if the product it's is formed it's there just as a if the product is formed then it stays there it does not decrease in concentration therefore it's incorrect for c here's assuming that both y and x end up at the same product concentration this is technically impossible because i said in y the enzyme has been denatured midway therefore not all the substrate is going to be converted into products therefore y is going to have a lower product concentration therefore C is also incorrect, same as B. Now let's look at D. Here we can suddenly see that for X, the product concentration is increasing and for Y, product concentration is decreasing. This is very strange because enzymes do not operate in reverse. Therefore, the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 13. What affects the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction when in the presence of a non-competitive inhibitor? Now, as we all know, a non-competitive inhibitor binds to an allosteric site of the enzyme changing the shape of the enzyme so an allosteric site is any other site other than the active site of the enzyme then what happens is that the Vmax now decreases for those who don't know Vmax is the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction now decreases because the enzyme shape has been altered therefore less substrate is converted into products now here it's asking what affects your rate. Now let's see. One, enzyme concentration. Of course, enzyme concentration impacts the rate because as you increase the enzyme concentration, more substrate is converted into products per unit time. Why you would ask? Because there are more active sites available. So this is correct. For two, inhibitor concentration, of course. The less inhibitor concentration, the higher the rate of the reaction. Now for three, substrate concentration. Of course, if the higher substrate concentration, the more substrate converted into products and the more collisions of substrate with the active site of the enzyme. Therefore, the increased collisions increases the rate of the reaction. Therefore, it's incorrect and the correct answer is going to be A. Question number 16, the diagram shows the water potential of three adjacent plant cells P, Q, and R, which shows the net movement of water between cells P, Q, and R. So the net movement is basically the movement of water from higher water potential to lower water potential. Now let's look at all the cells here. For the less negative water potential, the less negative one means it has the highest water potential and the most negative water potential basically means that it has the lowest water potential now as we all know water moves from the higher lower water potential to a lower water potential so what happens is water moves from p to q and also from p to r and because r has a higher water potential than Q, water also moves from R to Q. Now for A here, we have P to Q, which is correct, P to Q, and P to R, here P to R, 
and then R2 cubed. Going down, water potential gradient. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Question number 17. Which row correctly describes parts of chromosome structure present during mitosis? Let's start with A. Centromere, region of chromosome with no DNA. This is totally incorrect. Centromeres actually are rich in DNA. Therefore, A is going to be incorrect. For B, region of non-coding DNA holding two chromatids together. This is correct. Chromatid, double-stranded DNA molecule with histone proteins. This is correct because a chromatid is made up of a single DNA molecule. So it's a double-stranded DNA molecule wrapped around the histone proteins to make it compact. And two chromatids held together by a centromere. By the way, centromeres hold the two chromatids together. So two chromatids with a centromere forms a chromosome. Therefore, this is also correct. And for those who don't know telomeres, telomeres are length of DNA at the end of chromatids that protects the chromosomes from gene shortening and prevents the loss of DNA. Now, region of DNA with many short repeated sequences of bases. This is correct. They are made up of non-coding DNA and repeated sequences. Therefore, B is going to be the correct answer. Let's look at the rest. Region of DNA with no histone proteins that allow separation of chromatids during anaphase. This is incorrect. It actually has histone proteins. Now, for chromatid DNA molecule coiled round histone proteins to form a chain of nucleosomes. Currently, nucleosomes is out of the syllabus and you don't have to know what it is, but just for your information, nucleosomes is when four histone proteins are wrapped around a length of DNA. This forms a nucleosome. So this is correct because many of these histone proteins or many of these nucleosomes coil together to form chromatids. Therefore, this is correct. Tell me a region of DNA with no proteins that protects the end of a chromatid. No proteins is incorrect because actually it does have proteins. For D, centromere, region that attaches to spindle microtubules and divides during prophase. Attaching to spindle microtubules is actually correct. This is what separates them during anaphase. And now, divides during prophase, centromeres don't actually divide, so this is incorrect. Chromatids, one of the two identical DNA molecules that was replicated during interphase. This is correct, they are replicated during the S phase. Telomere, region of non-coding DNA holding the ends of the chromatids together. Okay, it's centromere that holds the chromatids together, not the telomere. So this is incorrect and the answer as we said is going to be B. Question number 19, scientists have made a nucleic acid HNA that has a sugar with the same number of carbon atoms as glucose instead of deoxyribose. Although genetic information can be stored by HNA, naturally occurring DNA polymerase cannot replicate HNA. Which statements could explain why naturally occurring DNA polymerase cannot replicate HNA? Now let's see what is even HNA and how is it different to DNA. Here it says that it has a sugar. As we all know, nucleotides look something like this. They have a pentose sugar or a ribose sugar and a nitrogenous base and a phosphate group. Now here it says that HNA has a sugar with the same number of carbon atoms as glucose. As we all know, glucose is actually a hexose sugar. So it has six carbon atoms. So structure looks as almost a hexagon. But deoxyribose has a ribose sugar and ribose sugar is five carbon atoms with a different, almost a pentagon structure. Therefore, it's very normal for HNA to have a larger shape or a different structure than the normal deoxyribose. Now, let's see the suggestions that we have here. Now, I hope you're familiar with HNA and how is it different to DNA. Now, which statements could explain why naturally occurring DNA polymerase cannot replicate HNA? Now, DNA polymerase is what forms the phosphodiester bonds between nucleotides. 
Now, one, DNA polymerase cannot form bonds between sugars of two HNA nucleotides. Okay, the bonds actually don't form between the two sugars. They form between the phosphate group and the sugar. Not between two sugars, so this is incorrect. Two, DNA polymerase cannot form hydrogen bonds between the two HNA nucleotides. As we said, DNA polymerase actually forms phosphodiester bonds. Therefore, this is also incorrect. 3. HNA nucleotides do not fit in the active site of DNA polymerase. This is totally correct because as we said, HNA has a hexose sugar which is way larger than the ribose sugar because it has 6 carbon atoms instead of 5. Therefore, it won't be able to fit in the active site of DNA polymerase and this is correct. 4. The shape of an HNA nucleotide is slightly larger than that of the DNA nucleotide. This is correct because of the point we just mentioned. Therefore, the correct answer must be D. Question number 20. Which statements about the nucleotide containing uracil are correct? So the nucleotide containing uracil is an RNA nucleotide which has a ribose sugar instead of a deoxyribose because DNA has deoxyribose sugar and RNA nucleotides have ribose sugar. Now let's see the suggestions. One, uracil is a pyrimidine. Yes, uracil is a pyrimidine. Pyrimidine is a single ring while purines are double ringed nitrogenous bases therefore it's correct your cell is a pyrimidine two the carbohydrate is always ribose this is correct because as we said rna nucleotides only contain ribose sugar three base pairing occurs with three hydrogen bonds no this is incorrect because your cell pairs up with adenine by two hydrogen bonding it's cytosine which pairs with guanine via three hydrogen bonding. Therefore, this is incorrect and the answer is going to be B. Question number 21. DNA replication involves several stages. Which statements about DNA replication are correct? Now, for one, each strand of DNA double helix acts as a template for the opposite strand. Now, let's here look at an example to make it easier for you. So. This is strand number one and this is strand number two of a DNA, full DNA molecule. Now, let's imagine that strand number two has adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. Now, when DNA polymerase lines up complementary nucleotides on strand number two in order to form a complementary strand by complementary base pairing, what happens is DNA polymerase pairs up thymine, adenine, cytosine, guanine. Therefore, it is a template of the opposite strand because as we said, they line together by complementary base pairing. Then strand number one must also have thymine, adenine, cytosine, and guanine too. Therefore, the first one is correct. Two, the enzyme DNA polymerase links bases together. This is also correct. Question number two, the enzyme DNA polymerase links bases together. Here, this is incorrect because the enzyme DNA polymerase, what it actually does is forms phosphodiester bonds. Therefore, this is incorrect. Three, Hydrogen bonds between bases adenine and thymine and between cytosine and guanine are broken. This is correct because helicase enzyme must unzip the two strands apart. And this happens by helicase enzyme. Therefore, the bonds between bases has to actually be broken. Therefore, this is correct and the correct answer must be in this case C. Question number 22. The sequence of bases in mRNA for the first eight amino acids in the beta polypeptide of adult hemoglobin is the following. Which change occurs to the amino acid sequence of adult hemoglobin to make hemoglobin C? Now, here I've converted the DNA triplets into RNA code to be able to make it easier for you to understand. Now, here the difference that you could see is GAG, 
turned into AAG. Now, here we're looking at the RNA because this is RNA code. What happens is GAG, which is glutamic acid, was converted into AAG, which is a lysine. Please don't be confused with phenylalanine, which is here, because this was a very common misconception. Therefore, the answer is going to be C. Number 23. Some antibiotics kill prokaryotes by binding to RNA polymerase. What effect will this have on protein synthesis? Now, RNA polymerase is what forms the mRNA molecule in the nucleus during transcription. Therefore, altering the activity of RNA polymerase would alter protein synthesis and the process of mRNA transcription. Now, let's see this is A. Codons on mRNA will be unable to hydrogen bond with complementary anticodons on tRNA. This is incorrect because, as we said, RNA polymerase alters the synthesis of mRNA, but it has nothing to do with hydrogen bonding between tRNA and mRNA. And this process that happens during translation in the cytoplasm, not in the nucleus during transcription. So this is incorrect. B. Condensation reaction joining RNA nucleotides will not take place to form mRNA. This is totally correct because RNA polymerase forms phosphodiester bond between RNA nucleotides forming the mRNA molecule. So this is correct. C. DNA will not unwind. So this is incorrect because what unwinds and unzips the DNA is an enzyme called helicase which breaks the hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands. D. Free RNA nucleotides will not base pair to exposed bases on the DNA template strand. This is incorrect. As we said, it, the RNA polymerase alters the formation of phosphodiester bonds, not the hydrogen bonding. Therefore, B is going to be the correct answer. Question number 24. The diagram shows transverse sections through parts of plants. Which of the labeled regions contains cells which are dead? So dead cells are going to be the xylem, vessel elements. The reason for this is that they are hollow strands. And by the way, phloem are not dead cells, they are actually living cells. Therefore, here we are looking for the xylem locations. Now let's start with the leaf. This is a cross section through a leaf. Now, a rule of thumb in a leaf, the xylem is always going to be upwards and the phloem is always going to be at the bottom. So phloem, therefore A is going to be the xylem. Now let's look at the rest. Now this is a cross section through a stem. And this is what a vascular bundle looks like. In a vascular bundle, what's on the outside is the phloem. And what's on the inside is the xylem. Now see the arrow points to the outside. Therefore, it's going to be the flow and not the xylem, so this is incorrect. Now here, this is a cross section through a root. Now, what looks like an addition sign or a cross is the actual xylem. And what's around it that points to D is going to be the flow. Therefore, the only correct answer is going to be A. Question number 25. The diagram shows the distribution of tissues in parts of a transverse section through a plant organ. Which row correctly identifies tissues 1, 2, and 3? Now, this was a common misconception because many candidates thought that this was a cross section through the vascular bundle of the stem. Question number 25. The diagram shows the distribution of tissues in part of a transverse section through a plant organ, which are correctly identifies tissues 1, 2, and 3. Now, this was a common misconception for many candidates because they thought that this was a vascular bundle through a cross section through a stem, but actually it's a cross section through a root because if we continue with the drawing here you can see the cross that we saw in the previous question therefore for one is definitely going to be the cortex and that's between the xylem and the phloem and the outside for two the barrier between the cortex and the xylem and the phloem is definitely going to be the endodermis 
By the way, epidermis is not found in plants. Be careful with the terminology. Epidermis are found in animals. Now for three, as we said, is going to be the phloem. And the cross is going to be the xylem. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Question number 26. The circumference of a tree stem was measured continually for 48 hours. The results are shown on a chart recording. What explains the changes in the circumference recorded during the 48 hours? Now, the, the only reason for the change in the circumference is something called cohesion, tension, theory. Now, what happens is that in the part of the day where it's the most sunlight, this is when the most rate of transpiration happens. This is the highest rate of transpiration. When this happens, therefore, this means that more water molecules are being withdrawn upwards at a faster rate. Now, water molecules go through the xylem vessel elements by two mechanisms. The first one is adhesion and the second one is cohesion. Adhesion is the hydrogen bonding between water molecules and cellulose cell wall due to the hydrophilic properties of cellulose and cohesion is the hydrogen bonding between water molecules. So hydrogen bonding between water molecules. When this happens and water molecules goes up at a faster rate due to the high rate of transpiration through the day, what happens is that the force of the water molecules are able to pull inwards the stem and make it tighter, decreasing the circumference of the stem. So I'll repeat again, because water is withdrawn upwards at a faster rate, this cohesion and tension causes the stem to go inwards, to move inwards, tighter almost, like pulling on a straw. Therefore, let's look at the suggestions that we have here. A. Adhesion forces decreases during the night. This is incorrect. B. Cohesive tension forces increasing during the day. This is correct because the only reason for the decrease or increase in circumference is always going to be cohesion forces. Therefore, B is going to be the correct. Question number 27, which description of movement in the phloem is correct? A, adding sucrose to a sifted element increases its water potential. This is incorrect. Adding sucrose means the water potential decreases. B. At a sink such as storage organ, sucrose is removed from a sift tube element and polymerized into storage. So at the sink, sucrose is actually not polymerized to starch because sucrose is a disaccharide and starch is a polysaccharide. And as we know, sucrose is made of alpha glucose and beta fructose. But starch is actually just made of alpha glucose monomers therefore this can be true and this is incorrect see at a source such as a photosynthesizing leaf sucrose enters the sift tube element by facilitated diffusion facilitated diffusion is incorrect now we're going to see the process of loading sucrose into a phloem sift tube element so what happens is this is a companion cell and Adjacent to these companion cells are going to be mesophyll cells, which synthesizes sucrose, which is a disaccharide. What happens is that companion cells pump hydrogen ions to its cell wall, outside the cell, to its cell wall by a proton pump. Then what happens is both now sucrose and hydrogen ion goes back inside the companion cell by facilitated diffusion through a protein called a co-transporter protein. So co-transporter. So it only enters the companion cell by a co-transporter protein 
and by facilitated diffusion only into a companion cell but be careful here it says enters a sieve tube element by facilitated diffusion this is incorrect because once the sucrose is now inside the companion cell what happens is now because there is a higher sucrose concentration in the companion cell it moves to the phloem sieve tube elements down sucrose concentration by normal diffusion not facilitated it only enters by facilitated diffusion through the companion cell, therefore this is incorrect. The other source, sucrose, is loaded into a companion cell using a protein that carries both hydrogen ions and sucrose molecules. We just mentioned that this is going to be a co-transporter protein, therefore this is correct. Question number 30. The enzyme carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction. Which statements describe the role of the enzyme carbonic anhydrase? So, enzyme carbonic anhydrase catalyzes the reaction of carbon dioxide and water to carbonic acid. Now, this carbonic acid dissociates into both bicarbonate ions and hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions stays in the red blood cell while bicarbonate ions leave and stay in the plasma. Now. Let's see the suggestions that we have here. 1. To speed up the decrease in pH of blood in the presence of carbon dioxide. Of course, if there is more carbon dioxide present, this means that more carbon dioxide and water are going to be converted into carbonic acid. Therefore, more carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ions. And as we all know, a decrease or an, in sorry, an increase in hydrogen ions, this means a decrease in the pH. Therefore, this corrected does speed up the decrease in pH too to facilitate the Bohr effect in hemoglobin. The Bohr effect happens when the concentration of carbon dioxide increases. The reason for this is as we said that because the concentration of hydrogen ions increases, this means that hydrogen ions binds to hemoglobin forming hemoglobinic acid. And hemoglobinic acid has a very, very low affinity to oxygen. Therefore, oxygen is released. This means an increase in carbon dioxide concentration means that more oxygen is going to be released from hemoglobinic acid. Therefore, a Bohr effect takes place. And hemoglobin has a lower affinity to oxygen. 3. To speed up the reaction between carbon dioxide and water, as we said, this is correct. And the answer is going to be A. Question number 31. The graph shows the oxygen dissociation curves of adult hemoglobin at two partial pressures of carbon dioxide W and X. Which pair of statements are correct? Now, let's just break it down. Here it says the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. And as we can see that curve W shifted to the right, this means that curve W has a higher concentration of carbon dioxide because of what we just mentioned in the last question about the Bohr effect. And curve X is going to have a lower concentration of carbon dioxide. A higher concentration of carbon dioxide means that more hydrogen ions are going to be present and bind to hemoglobin forming hemoglobinic acid. Hemoglobinic acid releases oxygen because it has a lower affinity to oxygen. Therefore, the percentage saturation at the same partial pressure, for example 6, is going to be lower for curve X. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. 1. Curve W shows the oxygen dissociation curve at a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. This is correct. Now curve X shows the oxygen dissociation curve at a higher concentration. As we said, this is incorrect. 3. At a partial pressure of oxygen 7 kilopascals. The hemoglobin from curve W has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin for curve X. Incorrect. For at a partial pressure of oxygen 7 kilopascals, the hemoglobin from curve X has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin from curve W. This is correct because hemoglobin from curve X has a lower concentration of carbon dioxide. Therefore, oxygen is released less easily. Therefore, 1 and 4 is correct and the answer is going to be B.
32. A person has two blood tests, one month apart. The number of each type of cell in a fixed sample size is counted. What could this suggest about the person based on the results after one month? Now, let's see. For the first test, it was a normal red blood cell count. After a month, it was higher. And for the lymph sites, for the first test, it was normal. Then after a month, it was also higher. Let's start first with the red blood cells. Here it says move to a higher altitude. Yes, moving to a higher altitude is the only thing that could increase the concentration of red blood cells. It's only in the syllabus, of course. Okay, so this is correct. The reason this happens is to compensate for the lower partial pressure of oxygen at a higher altitude. Therefore, we need more red blood cells to transport the same partial pressure of carbon dioxide as was before the person went into a higher altitude. Now, let's look at the lymphocyte part. Here, after a month, there is a higher number of lymphocytes. This basically means that there is an immune response taking place. The reason for this is when an antigen encounters a B cell with complementary B cell receptors, what happens is that antigen with complementary B cell receptor binds to the B cell. When this happens, this stimulates the B cell to divide into both plasma cells and memory cells. And as we all know that plasma cells secrete antibodies. So first of all, because there is a primary immune response or any immune response taking place in general, the body temperature must be higher. So this is correct. And ATP synthesis is also going to be higher. The reason for this is because we said that plasma cells secrete antibodies. Therefore, it requires more ATP to be able to synthesize the proteins or for higher rate of protein synthesis. Therefore, D is going to be the correct answer. To number 36, if someone smokes cigarettes, what will be the immediate result of this action on the red blood cells? So as we all know, an outcome of smoking cigarettes is definitely going to be carbon monoxide. So we all know that carbon monoxide and oxygen both have the same binding site on the hemoglobin molecule. So both have the same binding site, they bind to the same area. But hemoglobin has a higher affinity to carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide has the priority to binding. Therefore, what happens is now the concentration of oxygen now decreases because the priority is for carbon monoxide to bind to that same binding site. Now let's see the suggestions that we have here. A. Carbon monoxide will combine with the globin in hemoglobin. This is incorrect. What combines with hemoglobin is carbon dioxide. Is what combines with the globin, not the carbon monoxide. The carbon monoxide replaces carbon dioxide in carbon amino hemoglobin. This is incorrect because as we said that carbon monoxide only competes with oxygen. Therefore, this is incorrect. C. Less oxyhemoglobin will form. This is correct because as we said that the concentration of oxygen is going to increase because now carbon monoxide is what binds to the binding site on the hemoglobin not the oxygen because it has a higher affinity therefore C is going to be the correct number 38 some common antibiotics are listed the action of each antibiotic is described which of these antibiotics will affect the activities of bacterial cells only now, for one, rifampicin inhibits RNA polymerase. This is incorrect. It won't affect the activity of bacterial cell only. The reason for this is RNA polymerase is also present in the nucleus of eukaryotic cells. The reason for this is because it has two foreign phosphodiester bonds between RNA nucleotides during transcription in order to form an mRNA molecule. So this is incorrect, it will also affect the mRNA synthesis in animal cells. To streptomycin inhibits 70S ribosomes, this is also incorrect because as we all know that both chloroplasts and mitochondria in eukaryotic cells also have 70S ribosomes due to their prokaryotic features. Therefore this is incorrect 3. Neomycin inhibits DNA synthesis 
and of course that eukaryotic cells has DNA so this is also incorrect for ampicillin inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis as we all know peptidoglycan is a component of cell walls only if found in bacterial cell walls it's only unique to bacterial cell walls therefore this the only correct answer is going to be question number 39 which method of gaining immunity can be described as natural active immunity a feeding on colostrum colostrum is almost as breastfeeding this is what it means in simple terms and this is actually natural passive immunity b inhaling the chicken pox virus yes this is correct it is active immunity the reason for this is it's not artificial it's gained it in natural ways it's natural active immunity because it's inhaled the chicken pox virus and antigens have been presented to the b cells in the body c injection with antibodies now this is artificial passive immunity the reason for this is you have to distinguish between antibodies injection and antigen injection antibodies do not actually generate an immune response if injected it's antigens what generates an immune response therefore it's passive and artificial d through the placenta is also natural passive therefore the correct answer is going to be b Question number 40, which statements correctly explain why smallpox has been eradicated but not malaria or cholera? 1. Cholera vaccines provide only short-term immunity. Yes, this is a reason why it has not been eradicated because it, if it only provides a short-term immunity, this means that many vaccines are going to be needed and the spread is more prone. Therefore, this is also correct too. Plasmodium antigens change during the life cycle. Now, there is quite an issue with antigenic variation. Antigenic variation or change of antigens means that we also have to provide more vaccines with that same antigen. This means that more vaccines are needed for every antigen of plasmodium. Therefore, it has not been eradicated. 3. Smallpox antigen remains stable. Yes, this is actually a reason why it has been eradicated because if it remains stable, this means that no boosters or no more vaccines are actually required in comparison to plasmodium, which needs almost 10 vaccines to each antigen. 4. Vaccines only work against viruses. As we all know, this is also incorrect. It works also against bacteria. Therefore, the answer is going to be A. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you think it's useful, I'd highly appreciate it if you take a moment out of your very busy day and subscribe to this channel. Thank you very much for watching and if you need help with any other questions in the same paper, please leave a comment down below.